Okay, so welcome everybody to this EAUC webinar um, on uh, declaring a climate emergency. I'm Fiona Goodwin, I'm the Director of Operations and Planning for the EAUC. Uh, we are going to be recording this webinar um, for further members who, can, um, who are unable to make the meeting um, so they can watch it, um, otherwise it will be recorded. Um, and the presentation will be available on, on the website as well after the, after the webinar. Um, so I'm going to introduce, uh, we've got Martin uh, Wilde from the Head of Sustainability from University of Bristol and Matt Dunlop for Head of Sustainability for Newcastle University. Uh, they're both going to do a short presentation first and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. Um, I will mute you during the presentations just to avoid any background noise. Um, once we start the Q&A, if you just want to unmute yourself and ask any questions or you can use the chat box which is at the bottom. Okay, thank you very much. I'll hand over to Martin. Okay, hello everybody. I, so I've not, <clears throat> can everybody hear me? Uh, hopefully they can. Um, uh, so I've not got a, a presentation. I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about what we've been doing. Uh, and I'm basically going to talk a bit about our zero carbon target, the climate emergency that we've called, uh, why we've done it, and uh, what we're doing next, really. So hopefully sort of do that in, a, in a, just a few minutes. So, um, so our first thing really to sort of say is, uh, what's our carbon target? So we've got a net zero carbon target for scope one and two, uh, and it's to get to zero carbon by 2030. So, uh, and there seems to be a whole licorice all sorts of different zero carbon targets out there. So when I, when we were asked about the climate emergency, we looked at uh, lots of different universities and what they were doing. And there is a, a not, not lots of universities, lots of local authorities, lots of different uh, targets being, being set out there. So our target though, um, we set this uh, in 2015 uh, and that was as a response to, we were European Green Capital um, and uh, back then and we needed to make a number of statements about sustainability uh, and the zero carbon idea was floated uh, particularly by a number of academics so uh, initially it was kind of like <laughs> we'd never be able to do that um, so we then sat down and started to think about why it would be something we would want to do and how we would address that and we'd had targets before like most of most of you will have uh, to reduce carbon by a certain percentage um, Basically, we, it, you know, our carbon strategy was just revised to really see where we could push. We've added a few things into it, uh, and there's kind of eight key streams. You can see our uh, our carbon strategy on our website, uh, university website, sustainability. Um, but it, the eight areas were space, conserving, uh, efficiency, new builds, self-generation, local, low carbon generation. So that's district heat systems with, with maybe local authorities and then low carbon sources. So whether that's biogas or other things kind of related to decarbonisation of the grid and then find the offsetting. And each of those have a, a variable percentage relating to those. But each of those would help us step down to that 100 uh, percent reduction. Um, We've also had investment in place for quite a while for energy saving things. We our initial carbon management plan, uh, which is our carbon strategy, had a kind of 20 million pound price tag on it. So we've been investing for a while uh, and getting some good savings out of that. We've also got other things in place. So I've talked about new builds in that. So we've now got about 20 buildings that have been built uh, using uh, Briam as a, as a kind of guide to deliver a more sustainable building. So there's a whole load of things that are in place. Um, so we basically turned around to the university and said, well, yeah, if you want to make this pledge, we think we can get there. Um, and it was one of three pledges we made in 2015. Um, we reconfirmed that uh, as a, a key target in 2017 when we wrote a new sustainability policy. And that was really on the back of what the university wanted to do, which was that we had a new vice chancellor. We wrote uh, a new vision and strategy for the organization. It had key areas so six key areas the obvious things like you know education and research um, but one of those six areas was sustainability um, so with that as a backdrop there was uh, you know, kind of senior buy-in our vice chancellor was behind it our uh, pro vice chancellors so in that way we thought we had that well we had that 
support in place. So we continued with that, that kind of delivery. Um, and I suppose, you know, if you sort of say, how have, have I got that support? It makes it sound really easy. Oh, the vice chancellor supports it. Isn't that great? Uh, so I suppose it's about delivering, uh, in particular, delivering savings on the investments and, and showing those programs to be effective, um, as well as those all those other kind of engagement programs, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, things like uh, Green Impact or, or whatever. Those sorts of things have, have been shown to be very, very effective. So... Um, a final thing to sort of say, and I try not to steal Matt's glory on this one, in, in that um, uh, there was a big debate about just the zero carbon moniker. And if we were going to get people to really take carbon seriously and kind of man the barricades for this, you know, we wanted to have something that they would really feel behind. So, you know, saying something like 47% reduction on scope one by 20 30 and then we're doing scope two at 20 percent at 90 with all those kind of caveats that go on it that was just a bit too much and we needed to really cut to the chase so that was the zero carbon so that's kind of how we've got that target so when extinction rebellion wrote to our vice chancellor um uh the things that they were asking for which was a zero carbon target in particular we already had so it was an easier thing to do, easier thing to deliver. Um, uh, Extinction Rebellion wrote a really nice, very polite letter to the Vice Chancellor, uh, which I think got them in the door, really, with, with, with talking to them. Um, we set up a number of meetings. In fact, I got a meeting this afternoon, which was a, a result of that, to talk with one of our Pro Vice Chancellors and the students about what we would do uh, around this. Uh, but before those kind of longer term meetings sort of really came to fruition, we had um, uh, uh, a motion signed by about 100 academics in the university to uh, take to our Senate meeting to call for a climate uh, emergency. Uh, and that was discussed there. I was asked about whether we could achieve it. We obviously said, well, we have this target, we have a plan, we feel we can do this. And uh, Senate voted for it and said yes. So. It kind of sounds remarkably simple, but I suppose it's because it's been years and years and years of trying to get to this point. So actually this coming now was, you know, uh, 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 if it had come, I don't know, five years ago, it might be a slightly different different uh, kettle of fish. Um, so for us, we've had a, a kind of long gestation period to get to this. So why have we announced it anyway? I mean, what's the, the point of it? So there's a number of different levels to this. So obviously for our senior team, the kind of leadership was a, a key issue and they they were keen to show that you know this is something that's important and in particular uh, there's both an external and an internal audience and you know we've got like a lot of you out there will have researchers that you know been part of a variety of different teams the the ipc uh, ipcc team you know the the one and a half degrees in, in the next 12 years you know, a lot of our researchers are involved in, in that agenda uh, and doing that research and we're authors of those reports. So to not be seen to be doing those things would seem a bit, a bit strange. So um, so there is response there. Uh, student leadership as well. You know, we're very keen, obviously, like most of us, to, to show that our students are asking us to do things and we're responding to that. Uh, and in fact, uh, ex you know, members of Extinction Rebellion were part of the debate in Senate. So, um, uh, so that was that was good. Um, for me, it, it's a big communications, and uh, and it's a platform to get further action and further uh, integration into the organisation, and that's really key for me. And that leads me on to that, that final bit now, which is really about well, what next, and. Um, you know, obviously, we're going to continue to deliver those eight areas in our strategy. Uh, that's not really changing. Um, but it means that we can promote our work more effectively. People are now listening. Um, before, when we've talked about these sort of issues, it's not been as strongly picked up. So um, uh, for me, it, it's really a good time to be talking about this issue. Um, further engagement? Well, we want people to address this agenda, so uh, we've got a meeting uh, with the students and we're going to be talking to them about how they can help mobilise action around this. So it's great to ask for, for the big things and expect someone else to do it. I'm going to flip it back to the students a bit to sort of say, well, how can you help me now? How can you help mobilise students? Um, 
we have a lot of staff and a lot of academics and professional services staff that are coming back to me now sort of saying, well, what about this and what about that? Uh, so whether it's flights for overseas students or uh, academics or uh, simply, you know, our buildings really cold and old and manky. What are you going to do to sort it out? So um, there's a strong engagement for us really now. And this feels as though it's a good, good time to do that. Um, I'm also having one or two departments saying that they want to announce a climate emergency as well. And that's one of the things I want to build on. I want to start to sort of say, look, you know, people are saying this is what we're going to do in geography or management or uh, art history. This is what we want to do. This is our contribution to it. And I think that's a really strong outcome for this, that whole engagement and actually being able to talk about this agenda when before it would have been, what's this got to do with me? Um, and in particular, one that's been really useful is our head of planning uh, that helps sort of kind of organize <laughs> strategically for the university and said, what can we do to help? So that's going to be an interesting conversation when we have it. So that kind of gives you a quick run through of what where we are at. Uh, and uh, I think there's going to be time for questions after Matt's spoken, but back over to you, Fiona. Great. Thank you so much for that, Martin. Uh, yeah, we'll deal, deal with all questions um, after, after Matt, because I think a lot of the questions will relate to both parties. So, Matt, I'll hand over to you. Great. I'll try this uh, sharing my desktop thing again. Bear with me. Um, uh, where's it gone? It's no. share at the bottom. Show windows. There it is. It's the one that wasn't shown. There we go. So this is more of an aid memoir to, to, to sort of um, remind me how we got here. Uh, how did we get here is not, a, uh, it's not an existential question. I'm assuming that all those who are uh, um, uh, attending this webinar are bought into the fact that there is a climate emergency and, uh, um, and that we don't have to go through climate science and the like. So um, I really want to just set out some of that context first though so i hope that's working so the i think there have been some really important things that have raised awareness of of the issues in the university and i, I would put the, the the school strikes for climate first where um obviously we had um uh, a party of one outside uh, Parliament in Stockholm, which grew to be uh, tens and hundreds of thousands of students uh, across the world by, by March 18. That um, did not go unnoticed in, in, in the university. Um, in October of last year, we had the, the, the 1.5 degree uh, report. Um, and we've also had... Uh, grassroots in Newcastle um, calling on the city council to declare a climate emergency and that's a that's a photo from the local press of, of an event that happened last month which did in fact lead to um, Newcastle city council declaring a, a, a climate emergency uh, a matter of, of weeks ago um, but our context really is a is a bit more long-standing than that so and and where this has been driven from within the university is from our environment and sustainability committee which um i looked back at our our drive and, and looked back at the papers to see when the first papers were and they were back in 2008 it's always been chaired by our deputy vice chancellor um and that body acts as the uh the body that carries out management review of our environmental systems. Um, so we've always had that, that senior uh, oversight and engagement with the university's environmental management plans. But those other external um, drivers and context have, have uh, led to Questions coming from, you know, all quarters within the university, not least the student body, but also from academics and, and from, from others outside uh, the university. But we've actually had an environmental management system in place uh, uh, for about 10, 10 years now. 
Um, so, you know, we've got a long history of, 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 of dealing with the university's environmental impact. So we've got a good base to, to, to build upon. But I suppose what really kick-started the more recent work around um, zero carbon and, and the climate emergency is, is a change of leadership in, 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 the, in the university. Not that we weren't doing it before, but uh, our new vision and strategy, which um, we've had a new VC in, in 2017 and new Deputy Vice-Chancellor from, uh, I think, April 18. Um, and that led to a, a review of, of university vision and strategy. Um, and that was published in, in, in October 18, which has, as Martin said, the usual things you would expect to 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 see in a, a university vision and strategy. And in our case, on top of you know, research and teaching, there's a, a very definite strand around um, engagement and place and a strong focus on social justice. Um, and sustainability is by no means um, uh, excluded from, from that partly. You know, we're seen as a fundamental uh, enabler within the, the strategy to enable the other core strategy of the university to be to be achieved. So I think that focus on social justice within the vision and strategy and the and the measures that are being taken to um, make sure that that is uh, permeating throughout the organization has has been a real uh, driver for change. Uh, the university also signed the the Bay's emissions reduction pledge in, in, in October 18. Um, I mentioned that primarily because um, in addition to it being a, a worthy target to, to set and one that we felt that we could uh, achieve, it was actually, um, for me, it was six hours on a train with the Deputy Vice-Chancellor and, um, and that was invaluable in, in setting uh, you know, a path towards um, where we are today. Uh, I think... Um, uh, you know, I benefited hugely from that, from having the year of the Deputy Vice Chancellor and talking about these issues. And, and uh, it was, uh, you know, a, a, a key sort of moment for me in, in, in developing that relationship. Um, and that allowed us to, 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 to have a, a discussion at Environment and Sustainability Committee, um, where as part of our normal management review process that we've been carrying out for years, where we report to the university on how we're performing against uh, objectives and targets. Um, we also were reviewing our, our policy recently. Um, so this is, this is literally in the last uh, few months, um, we we're going through the process of reviewing the policy. And Really, our policy was was uh, EMS policy 101. You know, it had all the commitments in there that you would expect to see: um, a prevention of pollution, uh, uh, um, a commitment to continual improvement, all those things that that sustainability um, you know, fourteen thousand and one requires. But really, we had a more fundamental look at it in light of the um, uh, our vision and strategy, our newly published vision and strategy, and um, taking a sort of risk based. Uh, look at it and um, so we took a particular look at, at carbon we looked at all university impacts and so we were presenting graphs like this which you can see where you know the the, um, the red line there is the Bayes pledge the the, the the green dotted line is the um, is the 43% uh, uh, target that the, the sector adopted that Martin referred to but really uh, we also presented, um, I felt that we that the university needed to adopt a target that was more easily communicatable than, than 43% uh, by uh, 21 or whatever that year is that the, that, that one was. Um, you know, if I can't remember it, how, how, how can we expect the university to, 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 to get behind it? So we looked at, um, as we knew that the, the government was, was asking the Committee on Climate Change to look at, at net zero carbon, you know, the first place to, to, to look at really was net zero carbon. Could we, could we do it? Do we think we can do it? I'm um, head of the sustainability team in, in the university now, but I'm an ex-energy manager. I love a spreadsheet. Um, 
So I got our current energy manager to start trying to plot that path. And really the discussion we had on, on the, the technical basis was, well, we don't know how we can do it, but we think we can do it. There's a gap. Uh, we don't know quite what's going to fill that gap at the end, but reasonably, um, with a reasoned set of assumptions, there's a number of ways that you could get there. That's plotted on that graph. And we had that conversation with the students, with the academics, with the, the, the service leads that attend Environment and Sustainability Committee. But to be honest, the, 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 the bulk of the conversation wasn't around, you know, biofuel CHPs and uh, anaerobic digesters and, and, and other things that, that the university is doing to uh, reduce its emissions. It really was values led and it was about principles and it was about how we as a university can uh, deliver uh, on one of our guiding principles of visibly leading. So um, we felt that 2050 really wasn't a, a um, wasn't leading enough and that if, if HE can't deliver net zero carbon, then how are other sectors going to deliver it? So, uh, and, you know, that led on to a discussion about, um, what the target should be, what the date should be, and how we would engage the whole institution in a program to to get us to that to that point to build on where we've we've got to, um, um, but to get us to the to, to, to net zero carbon. That to me was was a, a a challenge. Though I put that that you know it was me that promoted the net zero carbon target. Um, you know, you have it drummed into you that you need a smart target, you know, and, and in some respects, you could argue that, 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 it, that it isn't smart because we don't know all the, the, the measures that we will need to take. But I think my Deputy Vice Chancellor who chairs the uh, committee puts it better than me as a professor and professor of English. And, and where we got to following that meeting on, on, the, on the 10th of April is a decision to declare uh, a climate emergency because it's only by engaging the whole organisation that we that we will be able to get there and to and to find those measures that are required to to, to deliver it. And um, if not a university, then then who would be the question? So Judy puts it um, uh, better than I ever could here. Uh, it will take every ounce of our imagination and effort, um, but we're, we're up for the challenge and i um, pleased to be able to present it to you today and uh, have to take some questions. That's great. Thank you very much for that, Matt. Um, if anyone has got any questions, uh, please do use the chat box or unmute yourself. I've got a couple through already. Um, Jamie is asking... Um, has it accessed any more university funding or ways to shortcut processes so you can move faster? Um, from from my point of view, uh, we've we've had a, a plan in place. So uh, moving it faster is always a, a problem in a large organisation. So you can throw a bit more resource at it. So we're trying to do it in a a deliverable way but it's also trying to get others involved so so no i mean it, i haven't needed to ask for more we've got enough at the moment to uh within the the resources that we've got um we may have to speed that up there i i don't know at the moment but um i i, I feel happy about it i don't know about you matt i feel that um, we're, we're very much in the same sort of place so we also have had that that long sort of um investment program um working as I'm sure the universities are with organizations like Salix and others to, to deliver our carbon reduction um, measures, uh, working with the city council on, on district heat, um, um, coming up with our own projects that will deliver and, and, uh, and, and investing in, in our estate and, and, and trying to deliver that sort of um, student experience um, that, that, that we need to deliver in, in, in this day and age uh, whilst delivering the, the sustainability objectives. So we've, we've, we've got that history. We've got a funded program. Um, in all honesty, I do think it, me, it will mean, you know, as we try and get those um, 
uh, as we try and close the gap on the things that we don't know. Um, I think there will be things that will need funding, probably probably aren't funded at the minute. But um, you know, I haven't immediately followed up this climate emergency with a request to the FD for X million uh, more pounds of investment. You know, it's uh, we've got a funded program. We are investing in our buildings, and we we're on a path. I think as we clarify, uh, you know, that detailed list of projects and what they're going to deliver over the coming years, then we may well have a gap to fill, but uh, we'll, we'll get there. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, next question is, what parts will offsetting play in reducing carbon emissions to zero? Do you want to start, Matt? <laughs> um, just repeat the question, please, because I was looking at the one at the bottom and I've gone to the other one. Yeah. Uh, uh, what parts will offset in play in reducing carbon emissions? Mm, yeah, that is, a, that is a, a good question. So I think there's two sort of elephants in the room. Offsetting is one and, and the other is the way in which um, the UK or, or, or globally we account for carbon and how the sector accounts for carbon as well and, and whether or not... Um, you know who t who takes the benefit of of renewable energy that is produced off site if if um, under under tariffs and that sort of thing. So I think there needs to be a a sector led approach to addressing um, that issue and the the carbon accounting issue and make sure that everyone's on the same page and at least we're all using the same methodology and that that methodology is the same not just across HE, but across all sectors of the economy so that we're all reporting in the same way towards the same goal. I think that's something that's, that's important. Um, uh, in terms of offsetting, frankly, I've never been a fan. So we did have that discussion um, at Environment and Sustainability Committee and there was, um, you know, the question was asked, what, what role is there for offsetting? Um, I think as far as possible, we need to try and get there without significant offsets. And if we are using offsets, I would like to see something that is university specific, um, linked to university research, um, perhaps grounded in, in uh, place. Um, so whether that place is our international estate or whether that is uh, here in the Northeast, perhaps at, at our farms, um, I, I, I don't think throwing money at uh, any one of the organisations out there that, that, that claim to deliver offsets is, is the right way for us to be doing this. Mm. So, I mean, we're, we're dipping our toe in the water a little bit with uh, each of the eight areas that I talked about earlier on. We're doing some work in each of those. Uh, obviously, you know, our efficiency measure, our, our conservation measures are the kind of primary front and center things that we need to do and deliver. Um, plus all those other things, you know, the, the, the district heat, the renewables. So, um, but yeah, there is, there, there is an opportunity there. Uh, exactly like Matt said, there's, there's some um, potential issues about how we offset, who we offset, what the standards are. There are standards out there. Uh, we've looked at some of these, you know, the, there's a partnership uh, arrangement in the, the idea of what we're trying to do with some of our offsetting and to see what other value it can bring. So there can be lots of other values. So one of the things we're doing is about reforestation and it's groups, it's basically women's groups um, in developing countries being the people at the front of this. So there's a different set of values there that you're talking about so it isn't just about the off offsetting but it's not the first thing and you know i think we've we've put a figure on it of about five percent so if we get to 95 percent reduction and uh, how much of a conversation are we going to be having about offsetting i don't know so, yeah, yeah, yeah i think that's I mean, a that's a good point martin i mean i think that's ultimately what the graph showed there was a was a gap that was um uh around about that mark um so uh, I, I hope it is a small element, and if it is something that we that we need to do in order to be able to claim net zero carbon, I saw a question which was, "What does net zero carbon mean for for us here?" Uh, I, I'm talking about scope one and two emissions, though we are also concerned, particularly around um, the travel aspects of, of of scope three, as they're such a big part of the university's. Um, scope one and two, one, two and three emissions um, 
flight obviously is a is an area that we're we're going to need to start to think about yeah the, the, i mean with a few of the questions you know the i, I think for, for Peter, who was asking about, you know, what are we, what are we hoping to achieve? You know, I, I mentioned some of the things that we're thinking. I think for me, it's engagement and, and it's, a, it's a spotlight on this area that will mean I, I might be able to do more a little bit faster to get more buy-in that that's kind of the key for me the the flights thing is kind of interesting we've got some work that we're doing at the moment on on business travel um where um we actually found that uh our, our senior team were doing quite a lot of the flying unsurprisingly uh for our international kind of agenda um so we're actually sitting down with a lot of them discussing well what what would help here what what's you know there, there there is a there is initial sort of feeling about um flights that it's about well it's going to conferences uh and that's kind of part of the academic endeavor and yes it is but it's trying to sort of see well let's really unpick that let's really see what what you're doing uh around that flying and um, and is there other opportunities um I think we all sort of think of like, we'll fly to Australia and that's a brilliant thing. And we can have a holiday there as well while we're doing it as a, as a, in a kind of academic jolly. But I actually think a lot of the time it's sort of like that flight to a small industrial estate somewhere in Germany that you have to do five times because it's a, it's a prerequisite of the, um, uh, the funding requirement. And actually it's three days of your time, not three hours of your time. So how can we, better improve that so it's trying to find where the the benefits to these sorts of things are we've had questions asked about international students and, and flights there and we're part of that looking at flights we're looking at how we can incentivize and think about what we could do uh to you know to, to have international students not flying around all over the place constantly you know what can we do to keep them here while they're here you know rather than them flying back every uh, you know every few months so that there, there's lots of debates there there's no uh, we've not got a magic bullet for those yet no no I'd, I'd echo that we're having those same conversations and we're starting to look in in more detail at, at um the travel patterns at the university and um and start thinking about ways in which we can in a, you know, in what's going to be uh, always a challenging sort of financial uh, environment um, predicted over the, the coming few years. Um, how can we align uh, a need to, to perhaps uh, hold what we're spending on, on international travel whilst delivering uh, carbon savings uh, when the two don't necessarily align? And I think that is about, challenging some of the, the the travel patterns and making sure that the reasons behind the travel are uh, appropriate and you know I'll come back to that that word sort of just really um you know there is a there is a there is an equality argument around you know who it is that's flying within the university and what stage they're at in their career and and ultimately carbon is a rationing issue and if there is a uh an amount of carbon to go down, and this isn't something that we've we've put in in place. But if you think about it in a in terms of a carbon budget, where do you spend your carbon budget? Do you spend it on on the senior academic um, travelling round, or do you spend it on the early career researcher who's building their their career? And these are sorts of questions that we are going to need to to tackle to to address that issue. There's a, a couple of comments there about scope one and scope two. Uh, uh, on, on the question so so yeah ours is ours is focused on scope one and scope two our carbon strategy does include uh, a discussion uh, sorry not a discussion it does include targets around uh, scope three they're not they're not zero uh, of those and I think we're we're key to we, we want you know we, we I, I see what Peter's saying there about um, you know, doesn't it outweigh the scope one and the scope two? Well, it does. Uh, I keep on having to remind everybody, it is everybody else's carbon, that they are using those things to, to, to have an impact. And, and I want to try and engage people uh, through this, the, the uh, collective responsibility, but individual responsibility as well. So there's, I, I want to generate something out of this. The, 
Um, there was also uh, Julian's mentioned there about is this simply a statement of recognition or will it change the way you do things? I don't know where this might end up. Um, it's starting a conversation with some people that we haven't necessarily had a conversation with before. Um, so, so yeah, it's not you know saying calling a climate emergency, setting a zero carbon target, setting any targets is not the panacea. You've got to do something, and that's where for me it's about engagement. And if I can engage people with this because of this then that's obviously a, a step a step forward in, in my mind. But yeah, scope three is a really difficult one. Uh, I'd, I'd, love, I'd love somebody to be able to give me a panacea for how we can do scope three really well. Um, and uh, it, it, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think um, whilst the, the graphs that I showed earlier, and I don't want to dwell on those because, you know, they're full of, a, full of assumptions. They were scope one and two. Um, but that's not to say that we exclude scope three from our thinking here. So we are having a, a detailed look at particularly at, uh, at air travel at the moment. Um, and, you know, commuting is also uh, a, an issue, whether that's international student commuting or, or local commuting. Um, you know, all, all the all these issues and, and not least the, the procurement um uh, emissions in our in our supply chain um, I suppose methodologies for those are, are as you as you go through them really get weaker uh, particularly the procurement aspect and there is an element here of, of um, focusing the resource that we have on the things that we can make a difference on and uh, that's not to say that we can't exert pressure on 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 procurement, and I think that will come as the as the as the nation sort of gears up behind the need to to deliver deep and, and lasting um, carbon uh, emissions cuts. You know that's going to bear on on those who are actually supplying the university. But I think we need to be part of that that story as well in driving that that change. But certainly our focus at the moment is scope one and two plus flights really, or plus travel, I would say, uh, not, not just flights, travel generally, um, with um, uh, the broader scope three stuff um, to, be, uh, in, in the, to be continued box really where methodologies are weaker. Just to sort of add on to the, the, the scope three stuff, I mean, perhaps I've been a bit, a, a bit glib about focusing on scope one and two uh, it is a key issue for us as it is a key issue for us and um one of the things we've been doing working with our procurement team is looking at um whole life costing and how that as a methodology around what we procure and how we procure things and our tender process is something we're trying to integrate into that and it's quite a large it's a different way of thinking for them so that's a a journey we've been going on for probably a couple of years now working with that team to see about getting real change so it, it is a real problem and we know we can influence it but um yeah that, that, that's kind of where we are i, I noticed jamie, jamie agenbar was saying about um has it led to curriculum type activity um i mean we're doing quite a lot on curriculum and i think the focus on this just puts the light back onto the the senior team saying yes it's part of our strategy to deliver that broader uh, um, pan-disciplinary approach. So we have a thing called Bristol Futures, which looks at sustainable futures as, as, a, as a module and how we integrate that into courses. So, so there's a lot of work there, but lots of people are doing work in, in this area. I don't know whether this will def particularly change this area. Uh, uh, this, this emergency announcement will change this area. I don't know, but we'll see. I think it changes the, 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 the context. I think it enables, you know, uh, guys, um, um, teams, our, our teams really, uh, to have that conversation at all, all, all levels and, and all functions within, within the university. So, um, you know, a, a, a commitment to embed um, education for sustainability uh, into the curriculum is, is there within our policy. Um, it's an area that we we've done lots of work on, but it's an area where again there's there's lots of room for improvement. And I think having having declared the emergency allows you to have conversations that perhaps you wouldn't have had before um, with with people you perhaps wouldn't have had before in an, an organisation of, of six thousand staff. Um, so I think it, it it does 
change the game a bit in, in, and that's that's the what I'm, I'm looking forward to but we're we're literally only a few weeks in from having declared a, 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 a climate emergency and um, so it remains to be seen really what what the direct impacts are of of, of that of, of that declaration but uh, I do see it as a, as a way to, to as, a, as another lever with which to engage um, decision makers in the university. Uh, Matt, uh, Peter's also asked about what is Newcastle City Council's focus for its climate emergency statement and uh, I'm going to supplement that question with my own question in terms of how important was it for your own local areas um, you know, Bristol, for example, is very strong in this area. Uh, as you said, Newcastle has already uh, declared a climate emergency. How much do you think that has helped support your argument for your own institution? It, 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 it was certainly part of the context, but it wasn't really the, the, uh, the driver for, for, for our decision to, to declare a climate emergency. We work with the City Council on lots of projects, um, um, including district heat in, in the city you know that's one of the areas we're, we're working on them with um, we recognize the sort of challenges that they're under but they're really their 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 movement was was or uh, that, that picture that I showed of the of people petitioning the city council that that followed on from an extinction rebellion um, uh, petition that they got 3,000 signatures for um, I mean I should make it clear really that that Newcastle's decision to, to declare a climate emergency wasn't wasn't driven by that sort of pressure. Um, I don't know whether our Extinction Rebellion uh, um, local um, chapter um, are, are, are less focused on the university sector, but we, we hadn't had the same sort of letter that Martin mentioned earlier. Um, you know, we obviously have academics who are in, involved in the, in the movement, I'm sure, um, and the, you know, uh, students who have certainly engaged over many years now on on issues like divestment so you know we've got that engagement with the student body and with the academic body but our our decision to to uh, declare a climate emergency whilst that was part of the context it was more about um how we as a university are going to to, to live our values um so um yeah that's that that that, that is that is part of it i suppose the Extinction Rebellion had very specific requests that they made of the City Council to answer Peter's question. Um, you know, they wanted them to declare a climate emergency, number one. Number two, um, publish new carbon management plans to deliver net zero carbon by 2025. And that, that was part of the discussion that we had at Environment and Sustainability Committee in, in the university, because I... I, I said that I, I didn't believe that the university could uh, realistically um, deliver 2025. So there was a conversation about, well, if not 2025, and if the government's sort of long stop date is 2050, where should the university be be aiming for in terms of a net zero carbon target? And and we felt that 2040 was probably around around the right point. But uh, you know, there's 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 still a lot of work to develop that detailed list of measures that's that's going to deliver on that commitment but you know we've got the commitment from uh, from the vice chancellor downwards um, and particularly the support of the deputy vice chancellor who who chairs the environment and sustainability committee so i suppose in terms of a of a lesson um you know that others can learn from i suppose and i don't know how you do this i mean we have done it over 10 years you know it's been a 10-year process to the, and, and deepen the sort of um, nature of engagement with the senior team via that via that committee. You, you need to find a way to engage your senior team. Is is the message that uh, that I would, I would give from, from Bristol? Um, yeah, the the city council signed a declaration I think back in October. So uh, and yes, they have a, an agenda to engage the uh, organizations in the city around uh, um, zero carbon so yeah that what we've done fits with that and it's very much part you know there's still quite uh, a thrust of sustainability within the city you know uh, we talked about the european green capital that we had in 2015 so there's still a, a lot of that that going on um that there's a couple of things peter has asked about the um 
uh, green electricity, gas and assumptions around that. So um, I don't, hopefully there's nobody from Bristol on the, on this call at the moment, because I wouldn't want them to think that, because we, we have our, yeah, our, our energy all comes from renewable sources now. So uh, we could technically say, yeah, we're zero carbon and we can do whatever kind of funny manipulation to, to show that we're zero carbon. But I, you know, that's not really the point uh, of this, you know, the, uh, and I, th I think, from my point of view, um, we can do a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, I'm, I'm more thinking about that self-generation and that local generation and something that really is tangible rather than, you know, buying it on a, on a contract in, in that sort of way. That That's from, from my side of things. The opening hours one as well from um, oh, one of the questions there is, uh, an interesting one um, we've been tackling trying to push back a little bit on this sort of saying is is this really needed this 24-hour access so you know we have this from academics who are saying well, my research goes on all the time so I'd like to come in so we're trying to see how we can make our buildings a bit smarter to be able to enable that person to come in rather than turning the entire building on and that's a longer term plan but the other thing that we've we found is that oh the students want to have this and we're sort of saying well there's a mental health issue here about allowing students to just work all the time you know they're on enough in terms of social media all the time and there's an issue here so we talk about values you know we need to be looking after there's a huge safeguarding issue uh, around this so you know the, the open hours is has always been a push and we've been opening more and allowing more and it's trying to think about how those spaces that we do open where people might want to be working at different you know everybody works in different ways but we don't want to be creating a culture that says you know you're on 24 hours a day seven days a week yeah i think i think we all face the the, the, the questions and the and the, the comments that are coming through reflect the challenges that we all face in our organizations and uh, I don't pretend that declaring a climate emergency, in, in declaring a climate emergency, that we've got solutions to all these problems. You know, 24/7, uh, or the desire for more 24/7 spaces is an issue uh, here, and it is one that we're that we're tackling and pushing back on, and and, and writing policy around um, to, to to provide that that challenge. Um, um, but. Balancing these arguments, you know, it, I've now got the I've now got the the sort of uh, um, the arrow in my armory to sort of uh, you know fire if needs be. Well, look, in the context of a climate emergency, um, we need to consider uh, having fewer spaces where we give uh, extended hours occupancy and. I sort of agree with with, with Martin uh, on on twenty four seven. I'm not sure that. That 24/7 is 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 the should be the 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 norm. Uh, it should be the exception. I think there may be a call, you know, a need to have one or two 24/7 spaces to account for those different ways that people work and international students, particularly, you know, uh, tend to tend to want to, you know, if their their families are in different time zones and stuff, that they, you know, there are these sort of sub issues come out. But um, you know, we are. Again, it's, it's, ultimately, it's a rationing issue. You know, if we are going to make real and meaningful redu reductions, it means a change from business as usual. And, uh, um, you know, quite the success we have in, in changing that culture and, and moving us on to a new business as usual is, 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 is what we're all going to be on the journey for. Great, thank you both. I think there was just sort of one question that hasn't been quite picked up on yet. Um, was the decision to declare a climate emergency unanimously supported at both of your institutions? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, uh, I, I, the, you know, the, the, there was the, the kind of due diligence that goes with these sorts of things. So, um, you know, we had people in the room sort of saying, well, if we announce this, you know, is there a plan in place? Uh, so you're able to sort of say, yeah, we've got a plan. These are all the things we're doing. This is where we've got to at the moment. So because um, I think some people are coming, you know, it's particularly in our Senate, they came to the debate perhaps a little bit un, uh, unprepared about what the issue was. So they're asking some what for, for most of us would be quite sort of straightforward and maybe even naive questions so um so most of that there, there was no you know there were actually people 
um, there was there was one academic in the room said he you know he doesn't do that kind of activism and he says but if you're going to do anything on activism this is the subject so that was quite nice you know it's quite nice to see that sort of word come that, that kind of thought coming out so I think it's um, yeah I mean one of the things I say you know that just on that kind of you know why, why do all this sort of thing well I'd probably fire out to everybody to sort of say well what do you think you can get from it what do you think it's going to help you enable you to do uh, and there's hopefully been quite a few examples of some of the things that you know whether it's 24-hour opening or other issues that that this sort of thing can can do i mean obviously you've got to weigh that off against how much of a slog it is going to be to get it through the organization um and, and that that's something you you have to to judge with that um but yeah so. yeah um uh the honest answer to that question is that i don't know what the discussion uh whether it was unanimous executive board but the 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 the, the route was um from environment and sustainability committee uh, and uh i know that uh from my conversations with the deputy vice chancellor that uh, there was support uh for the the declaration from around the room and uh and from the bc and so um yeah we we decided it was time to declare a, a, an emergency. So um, uh, I'm sure that there were um, concerns expressed, which will be why um, I'm going to EB in a few weeks to, 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 to provide more detail around our, uh, our plan, you know, but uh, it's, um, it's got broad support across the, both the university and, and student body, I think is the, uh, is the answer I would, I would give. I think, I mean, one, one thing I'd just sort of say about that kind of getting support and, and how you get support, I mean, it is a really important thing how you um, get a culture of support for yourselves. I mean, the, the thing with the meeting for Senate, you know, I had four or five people who were just sort of academics who I'd never seen before standing up and saying they want to do this. And then you've got senior members of staff that we've done a whole range of work with over the years who are supportive of what we're trying to do in, in sustainability. So, you know, dissent, you know, you, you, you know, you're in a room with, it's not dissent full. It's, it's full of people that are advocates and helping. So those voices, those dissenting voices become less shrill, if you see what I mean. So um, uh, it's not the first voice you hear. It's other people that will, will wade in. It's not just me, you know, saying that. So, and, and that's quite a difficult thing. You have to build that culture. You have to build that relationship with people. You have to find where your agenda might meet other people's agendas and how that can work together. So it's not an easy, not an easy, easy thing to do. No, that's, that's, uh, I'd, I'd agree with that. And that's why I sort of highlighted the sort of, uh, the sort of long history. It's not a, it's not a knee jerk response to, to those, you know, to Greta Thunberg and, 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 and Extinction Rebellion. It is a, a, a part of a process, a part of a journey that the university has been on to, to, to deal with its environmental impact. So, and we have developed those relationships over, over that time. Um, but for sure, uh, a change in, in senior team and, and uh, a vision and strategy and a test of, of all activ university activity against, um, you know, are we, are we living our values in, in, in what we're doing here? Um, is something that is is very genuinely happening within within the university, and uh, and see there's there's questions against around divestment. You know, there's that there's an issue for 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 us here. We've made progress on divestment, but we are not yet fully divested. Um, we have a, a target to to, to reach um, divestment by by 2021, and we're on on track to deliver that. Um, but you know those those issues are difficult because you know the student body wants to see you know full full divestment from um, you know yesterday and you know I I can understand their viewpoint and then, but we do have to deal with the the realities about how the university in, invests its money so you know it's about setting a a course which we can uh, deliver and uh, I think we can deliver uh, this target, but I don't know all the ways in which we're going to do it. So uh, I need to bring the university along with me to, to, to do that. And that's across all our activities, you know, from finance to education to, to research and 
finding the ways to integrate all of those across what we do as a university. You know, that's why we should be able to deliver. And, uh, um, you know, having your senior team there to make those, to, to help you make those links is, is you know, it's fundamental. If you, if you don't have that, then, um, yeah, uh, that, that is going to be a challenge for you. I think in each institution, you, you mentioned about, you know, uh, I think Jamie's mentioned there about, geology types and <laughs> and saying things there I, I i think um yeah each institution probably has its foibles of things that are uh, eminently so easy to do uh, and everybody's on the bat on the bandwagon with them uh, another th and a different institution has a yeah, the exact opposite uh, that it's impossible and you know you're taking away academic freedom or something so it it is really difficult to know with those things all you can do is um, uh, keep on really with it and uh, that's the kind of approach we've taken over a number of years so. yeah and explain explain as best as you can what you are doing uh, what you what you aim to do and and how how others can can help you know and and I suppose one of the challenges for me and my small team is is how we embed this across across the university you know how how do we have these conversations with an organization of of 26,000 staff and and, and 6, uh, 26,000 students and 6,000 staff you know because everyone's got a part to play in it and um you, you know there are trade-offs to be to, to to be had there are there are definitely going to be challenges uh, that, that we've delivery um that's why we've got to develop a culture. And I think this is, you know, having a very clear statement that there is an emergency uh, and, and a very clear target that is unequivocal uh, and easy to communicate helps us get there. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of work to do to get there. Okay, I think uh, we'll make this the uh, final question because uh, we're nearly out of time. Um, how much of your net zero reductions are going to be made up of on-campus renewables and do you have any limitations enforced by your DNOs? Yeah, well, well I suppose I'd echo Mark Martin's said there, you know, that renewables play a role, that efficiency is key. I, I, I agree with that. Uh, we're looking at both. Um, so, you know, we've been on a journey of, of, of improving efficiency. Uh, we've still got plenty of stuff that, w that we can do at, um, uh, at a reasonable uh, cost uh, and payback. Um, but ultimately, in, in achieving net zero carbon, we are going to get to a point where, where efficiency savings uh, um, aren't the answer and that we do need to, to, to self-generate. And we are looking at ways in which we can do that. So, you know, we're looking at... Uh, projects like um, uh, biogas uh, CHP on our uh, anaerobic digestion plant. Um, we're looking at biofuel CHP on, on campus. Um, we've already got a range of, of, of uh, you know, um, renewable technologies installed on, on the university campus, but ultimately their contribution is in a city centre estate. Their, their contribution is likely always to be quite small in, in percentage terms so um, you know we need to uh, we need to look the big challenge being obviously decarbonizing heat um, you know which is why working with other actors in the city including the city council on on, on district heating and uh, is, is important yeah I, one, one thing I'd just say that um, We've had a big debate about decarbonisation. It almost feels as though um, we've almost had that conversation where people have sort of said, well, you just don't need to do anything because decarbonisation, the grid will solve it all for you. And, uh, you know, obviously we had to sort of say, well, our, we, we predicated ourselves by reducing electricity consumption up until now. So all our systems are wet heating systems. Uh, so, uh, so we're going to have to do quite a bit of investment to change it to those decarbonized sources. So, you know, it, 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 it's not, it's not a straightforward, um, swapping out of these things. I mean, and I think of all of these things as, you know, you, um, it's that kind of thing of trying to look for, uh, money to, 
to pay the milkman and so you're looking in all pots of the houses in the house and you know under the sofa to get the money together for it you're looking in everywhere you can so they all play a significant role you know i i, I don't know what the percentage is uh and i think in our in our plan we probably put about 20 10 20 percent towards kind of renewable type activities which might include things like district heat and and biogas which are other low low carbon sources so yeah i i don't know but you know that's we're doing bits of those we're doing you know we're doing quite a few bits of renewables but it has to be uh, that's all been cost effective kind of stuff and it's been really focusing as i said on the efficiency side for us there's so much still to go out there you know i'd love to see i'd love somebody to invite me to their uh, energy efficient university so i can see what it looks like yeah I'd love, I'd love to see that you know i'm sure i'm sure particularly if there's one in i don't know montreal or somewhere i'm quite happy to go no 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 man. <laughs> not with this audience <laughs> Okay, uh, on that note, <laughs> um, thank you very much for everyone to attend the webinar. A uh, big thank you to Matt and to Martin um, for sharing all your um, thought, thoughts and experiences there. I think that was really helpful for the sector and uh, we hope that that has inspired lots of other members to uh, commit to a climate emergency and get that engagement. Thank you. So, yeah, thank, thank, thank you very you much. Thank Good you luck, guys. everybody. Yeah, good luck. Thanks, Fiona. See you again. Thanks, Martin. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Matt. Bye.